Whoop. That was your zero minute warning. Welcome everybody to the comedically under season stand up show. <laughs> yeah. Give it up. A night of funny comics and ambient pretzel smell. Yeah. I love it. Soak up that buttery atmosphere. So I'll be your host tonight. My name is Pete, and I'm from Detroit. Yeah. Wanted everyone to feel a little carjacked right off the bat. Don't worry, we'll gently rebuild trust. Um, I like to think that I'm a, a kind of approachable guy. Um, the reason I say kind of is uh, people will come up to me and ask me for directions, but usually they'll stand like two arms lengths away. Uh, I think it's because I look like the guy that farts on airplanes. <laughs> yeah. My body type just screams 7 a.m. pre-flight breakfast burrito. <laughs> Extra pintos. <laughs> yeah. my, body, my body image is in this weird twilight zone where technically, according to the body mass index, I am obese. That's right, I'm the face of obesity. Um, but, you know, if you took a poll of people here as to which decade I would have my first heart attack, the answers would be all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I found out that I'm the guy who their family and friends, when you haven't seen them in a while, they always tell me that I look like I've lost weight. And, th you know, occasionally that would be nice, but, like, when it's every time, you're kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> If I lost a pound for every time someone said that to me, I'd look like Macaulay Culkin right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, it's this weird, you know, or they'll say, um, you look good, Pete, you look good, which just means, like, I always picture you way fatter. <laughs> 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 but good for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's this weird paradoxical phenomena where I'm, you know, simultaneously being complimented and being perceived fatly. <laughs> it's, I call it Schrodinger's gut. <laughs> um, so one other thing about me uh, is that I like kind of like low budget radio stations or college radio stations and Boston's a cool city for that. A lot of you know small time radio out there. I was actually the other day listening to the local reggae slash Caribbean station, pretty cool. Uh, this song comes on, you know, it's pretty catchy, and um, you get to the hook, and the singer starts imploring his dance partner to, quote, back that booty up like a hard drive. <laughs> so, never? <laughs> like, I mean, is there a more universally, like, ignored request globally, you know, than do you want to back up your data? This guy's trying to get his girl to do something sexy by suggesting an activity that I haven't let Siri do in 600 days. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm, girl, I like the way you move that thing. Makes me want to habitually postpone it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Maybe I'm ignorant, uh, you know, I've never been to Jamaica actually, so I guess Potentially, you know, with all the weed usage there, there could just be like an increased public emphasis on data redundancy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, the good news in all this is that this song is actually fairly new because uh, if it had come out a couple decades ago, she'd be backing it up onto a three and a half inch floppy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one wants that. The only thing more uncomfortable would be a thumb drive. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, that, that's all the disc jokes I have for tonight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you guys jacked for these comedians? <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank uh, Somerville Media Center's Vox Pop Space, Erica Jones, for hooking this up, and Federal Realty Trust. Got to thank, thank the corporate overlords, you know. Um, but we got... 11 more comedians come up and they're all hilarious and the reason for this show is that they're young comedians that typically wouldn't get stage space but they're talented they're funny people and i want you guys all to see how funny they are 
So without any further ado, we're going to get our first comedian up here right now, Ramen Edmund. <laughs> Hello. All right. Uh, <laughs> so I've had trouble accepting lately that the fact that I'm losing my hair. I know you can't tell, but it's true. Um, I sometimes I catch myself staring at the mirror for hours. It's really quite pathetic. I'll stare at my hairline, and I'll tilt my head in different angles, you know, to find that one that works. I'll be like, all right, okay, yeah, we good. Yeah, we got all the hair, okay. <laughs> a little trick I do to uh, minimize the size of my forehead is I catch that good angle, right? Then I raise my eyebrows up as high as I can go. <laughs> and I just leave them up there for the rest of my life. <laughs> I just act super surprised all the time, you know? I'll be like, hey, man, I didn't think I'd see you here at your house. Wow. I'm so surprised. Uh, I ran into a tough situation recently um, at work, which is never good. Um, the CEO of my company, his name is Glenn, great guy. Outside of work, he's a yoga instructor in training. The other day, he came over to my desk and he said, hey, Raman, uh, me and some other instructors in training are going to be teaching a yoga class together tomorrow night. I was wondering if you'd like to go and do yoga with us. To which I said, <laughs> all right, Glenn, I'll, I'll go to yoga with you. Now, don't get me wrong, I like Glenn, I really do. It's just that I've never done yoga before, you know? I don't know what I'm getting into, I don't know what to expect, so I am kind of dreading it a little bit. But I go, and I'm, I go to the studio, and I'm greeted at the door by all the teachers who are Glenn, and 15 beautiful women. <laughs> wow. I'm like, all right, Glenn, what are we doing? Ooh, sorry, about that. I have a last <laughs> one. Uh, I'm, like, I'm like, all right, Glenn, what are we doing? We stretching? We doing a couple planks? What are we doing? Let's do some yoga, yeah. So first impression of yoga, it's really freaking weird. Like, yogis, what are you even saying in there? I didn't realize this going in, but they don't give all their instructions in English. They give a lot of their instructions in Sanskrit, which is kind of an issue for me, because I don't know any fucking Sanskrit. <laughs> I'll be over here crushing that warrior pose. I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. And, <laughs> and they'll be like, Bala Asana. <laughs> what? Bala Asana. Should I be doing the happy baby right now? No, everybody else is crouching on the floor. Why don't you do the same thing? Are you guys bilingual? <laughs> so I think, I think the reason they don't give all their instructions in English is because if they did, it'd be a little inappropriate, you know? It'd be a little PG-13. It'd be like, all right, everyone, here's what we're going to do. We're going to grab our ankles for that forward bend. Then we're going to get on our backs and spread our legs for that reverse butterfly. <laughs> Then we're going to kill him with that downward doggy style, as hard as you can go. Yeah, tell me how you feel. Bet you feel real good. So the last thing we do is we all lie down on our backs. Lights are off. Calming music's playing. Eyes are closed. And I feel one of the teachers come over, and she starts rubbing scented oil on the back of my head and neck. It smells so good, but it feels even better. I did not know they do this in yoga. So I take a peek at this gal to see who she is, you know? And it's fucking Glenn. <laughs> that oil might as well have been KY. I was shocked. I was so shocked. You should have seen my eyebrows shoot up then. <laughs> Hairline looked incredible. All right, guys, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, keep it going for Ramen Edmund one more time. Yeah!
his, uh, his eyebrows get caught up on the ceiling later. We'll help him get it down. <laughs> All right, guys, you're going to love our next comedian. Uh, she both looks and sounds like Morgan Freeman. Give it up for Becca McKillop. Hi. <laughs> it's me, Morgan. Um, I'm 22, and as you correctly assumed, I live in a house that my parents pay for, <laughs> which would be a really sweet living situation if they did not both also live there. <laughs> um, one thing that you should know about me is that I went to a low-budget preschool. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I didn't know that that's what it was at the time, but looking back, there were some clues. <laughs> was my preschool in a strip mall? Yeah. Was the only outdoor space a shared patch of grass with a nursing home? You bet. <laughs> was my teacher called Mr. Antonio? Of course he was. <laughs> and to this day, I don't know if that was his first name or his last name, but this one time, Mr. Antonio was trying to teach us an art and craft, and nobody was paying attention because there was a bug on the floor. And when you're three years old, everything that is a bug takes precedence over anything that's not a bug. So no one was paying attention, and so to remedy this, Mr. Antonio just picked it up and ate it. <laughs> yeah, he ate a bug. Really advanced <laughs> pedagogy happening at that school. And if we weren't able to pay attention to the art and craft before, we certainly were not able to pay attention to it after discovering that our teacher was a human aardvark. <laughs> the second piece of evidence that led me to believe this was a low-budget preschool was that the most popular activity was something called shaving cream time. <laughs> so... <laughs> That was unfortunately exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Mr. Antonio would go to Costco in the middle of the day, you know, like you do when you run a preschool. He would buy all the shaving cream, he would return, he would spray it on all the surfaces, and we would play in it all the day long. <laughs> Just playing in shaving cream. So, my best friend in preschool, her name was Rachel, and allegedly unrelated to what I just said about eating shaving cream, she got pediatric cancer. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> She's fine, you can laugh. <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say. She's fine, really. But um, I was really bummed that she got pediatric cancer, you know, because I'm a good person. <laughs> But I wasn't bummed for the right reasons. I was bummed because I was kind of like the head bitch in charge in preschool, and she was like my number two. But what happens when you get pediatric cancer is that you lose all of your hair from chemo. And what also happens is that you get a lot of attention. <laughs> and the issue with that is that I like attention. <laughs> so with Rachel walking around looking like Mr. Clean, I wasn't getting very much attention. <laughs> so I went home to my mom and begged her, please let me shave my head so that I can look like Rachel. And she was like, oh my God, that is so supportive. You want to support your friend <laughs> with cancer? What a good kid. And I had to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, you've grossly misunderstood me, mother. I said this at three. <laughs> I do not want to support Rachel. I want to upstage her. <laughs> I was not allowed to shave my head. Um, I'm from Chelmsford, Massachusetts. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and I'm also Jewish. So if you're wondering what the Jewish population in Chelmsford, Massachusetts is like, you are looking at it. <laughs> Just me. Um, this became abundantly clear to me that there were not a lot of others when in kindergarten, so a little later in life, I was approached by a boy on the playground who ran up to me asking, demanding actually, to know why did I kill Jesus? Which like, fair question. <laughs> Why'd I do that? <laughs> 
And I was like, mm, I don't know who that is, but if you're looking to start a heinous rumor, I heard Rachel was faking the cancer thing. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Becca McKillop, everybody. Yeah. Chelmsford in the house. All right, you guys. This next comic is probably like the nicest guy in the entire world. That gets thrown out a lot, but his name even matches it. Let's give it up for Jake Living Good. Tough act to follow, wow, and I'm the nicest guy. I gotta be clean tonight, boy. Uh, so I've been married for 21 years. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And I'm very fortunate because I actually proposed at a steakhouse. And uh, you know, I'm from the rural areas of Illinois and uh, that was a classy place to propose, uh, along with Red Lobster. Uh, but, uh, you know, my proposal felt a bit simple, you know, there wasn't, uh, you know, some paparazzi two booths over documenting our love for one another, uh, but there was a demilitarized zone of Cheerios and a kid in a high chair just launching shrapnel cereal all over the place. <laughs> the, the wait staff loved that one, you know, and sometimes I think of our proposal and if it were a commercial, it would be something like every kiss begins with steak. Oh, he went to Jared and the Sizzler. <laughs> you know, uh, in the farmland of Illinois, uh, a steakhouse is where you go to celebrate. Like when you win a limousine ride from a radio station contest to Ponderosa, a discount steakhouse in Illinois, which actually happened when I was 10 years old. I'm just glad my family didn't win the other radio station contests. I mean, a, a hearse ride to your gender reveal party? Yeah, a party bus to your court hearing? Come on, guys, what the hell? You know, I have all these steakhouse rites of passage, but I don't even like steak. I'm more of a veggie burger kind of guy. And I know that the guy in the back's probably thinking, oh, dude, you just lost some man points, didn't you? You know, and I think of this idea of, of manliness and, and what it means to be a man and this idea of man points, and I'm a little bit amused and confused by this gamification of masculinity through man points. <laughs> I don't quite get it, honestly. I, I mean, it's, it's so prominent and precious to people that there's an entire man card. And it's a very sensitive thing. If you put it next to leather or denim, it may you know, like somehow be deactivated like the apple card. <laughs> and also, if you hold it too long, you might lose any depth of emotion. You know, I've been described as a guy that looks like he would work with his hands yeah, or teach golf. <laughs> However, uh, I am far from that. You know, I'd much rather watch Sex in the City reruns with my wife. You know, minus 250 man points. Or, you know, but on the other hand of that, I, I like football. So, plus 250 man points. And I like American football, plus 50. But he knows the difference between American football and actual football. Minus 250 points. <laughs> you know, my wife rides a motorcycle, but I don't. Minus 250 man points. And 250 points in the bank for her. Nice job. <laughs> you know, I also have bought my wife some chocolates for Valentine's Day at CVS. Plus 250 man points. And she doesn't even like chocolate. Plus 100 man points. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, it's so confusing with this, and I, you know, I try my best and, you know, to be a man and who that is, um, but uh, it's, it's one of those things where uh, I just need to embrace who I am, you know? Uh, and, and, you know, I'm a career advisor, I'm not in a helping, I'm in a helping profession, my wife's in IT, um, and uh, I need to embrace the fact that my athleticism is probably best described by me passing out at my first cross country meet in high school. Uh, sometimes I feel pressure you know, to you know, boost my rewards on my man card, you know, and then I just think to myself, you know, I like Taylor Swift. <laughs> Minus 250,000 man points. 
But I just have to realize, you know, sometimes you just have to shake it off. <laughs> you know? Shake it off. Shake it off. Yeah, because I'm the only one of me. <laughs> and you're the only one of you. And I just lost my man card. <laughs> Thanks tonight. <laughs> have a good night. Jake living good. I hope you guys were all wearing sunscreen because he is a gosh darn sunbeam. <laughs> you guys are in for a treat. This next comedian is actually the only one who was a crowd request. That's right. One of one or more of the people in the crowd came up to me and said, I want this guy. He's a real treat, hilarious guy. Kevin Schwartz. So I've been working out recently. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to describe my physique to a friend, and I was like, you know, I'm not going to be on the cover of Men's Fitness or anything, but if there's a Men's Fitness for Jewish intellectuals, I might be able to get on that. You know, at the very least, I can be one of those guys showing out proper form for bicep curls. And I'd be on the cover wearing nothing but his Nobel Prize for economics. This is my way of saying that I noticed that my upper butt was getting firmer than my lower butt. Uh, you know, I, ch I was looking at it in the mirror, and, you know, my upper butt was, like, firm and popping, and my lower butt was, you know, a little less so. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to hate on it, you know. Stay body positive up here. It's a perfectly fine lower butt. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I went to Google to uh, find out if this was actually anatomically possible. Um, <laughs> And the fact is, I don't really know how my butt works. Uh, you know, I'm used to thinking of it as, uh, as you know, an entity in itself and not so much a compendium of parts. You know, it's, it's, pr it's pretty rare that I look at a girl and I'm like, yeah, she got a fatty lower butt. Uh, you know, it's not like they have exercises that turn your right cheek and not your left cheek. Um, but yeah, it turns out it's a real thing. And I found some exercises that target the lower butt so you can all sleep soundly tonight, knowing that you know, someday soon, my upper and lower butts will be in harmony once again. Uh, you know, another thing I noticed while I was checking myself out is, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's all right, you can laugh. Uh, no, it, it's a good thing that the penis isn't a muscle. Um, because the penis enlargement industry is like a billion dollar industry and doesn't even work. Um, so you can only imagine if we found something that did, um, you know, 14 year old boys across the country would be cutting school at the penis gym, you know, <laughs> spending all their allowance on penis steroids and, you know, doing penis push ups in the hallway. And they'd have to plaster, you know, PSAs all over the place and all over the airwaves. And, you know, honestly, I think that. Most kids would be receptive, you know, they're decent human beings, but they'd probably be that one 16-year-old boy who looks at the guy in the picture and is like, yeah, you say that now, but you're going to be singing a different tune when I bang your girlfriend with my 16-incher. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, you know, even the older, more mature men among us, you know, would probably succumb over time. You know, you look down and you're like, yeah. My balls could use a little tightening. Um, and, you know, you start working at it, you make some progress, and you're like, yeah, you know, those are, those are some testicles I can be proud of. And, <laughs> um, and you know, again, I'm, I'm not saying I'd have the most ripped ball sack out there, but <laughs> everyone's got to have a dream. I think if I work at it, I'll probably take on Spinoza. Thank you very much. Kevin Schwartz, woo! Our next comedian is a voracious racist. <laughs> Actually, it's true. He asked me how I could have the last name Mohan, um, which fairly, you know, it is like Smith in India, but it's, I was still a little hurt just because 
they recently named a young Indian rhino at the Buffalo Zoo Mohan. Doesn't mean it can't also be an Irish last name too, okay? <laughs> All right, let's get him up here. Yogi Mudailar! All right. Thanks, Pete. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, I'm Yogi. I was born and raised in India. Uh, I was born in a very, very, very orthodox and like super, super, super loving Indian family, actually. Um, you know, uh, who's, as a matter of fact, my family's here today, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. We're gonna have a very awkward dinner later today because they witnessed some <laughs> shit. Right? Kevin actually spoke about butts and penises, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm Yogi. Um, I recently entered my 30s, you know. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, the age when you're like too old for Snapchat, but at the same time like too young to have like life alert on your phone. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, like when you spend most, all, almost, or most of your weekends uh, attending baby showers, not because you're married or have babies, because those are the only friends you actually know, <laughs> right? And I feel like after 30s, um, there's like very less difference between your actual age and your waist size, right? <laughs> so yes, my waist is 30, right? And he's looking. <laughs> <laughs> And I feel like in eight years' time, I'm going to introduce myself as like, hi, I'm Yogi, uh, you know, and my age and waist is 38. <laughs> so, uh, but, I, you know, what I meant to say was 30 seems like the onset for everything that's related to depression, but that's not how it was for me, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was really looking forward to turning 30, right? No kidding. And the prime reason why I wanted to be 30 was because then I could finally grow a full beard, you know? <laughs> Like, have you seen those 25-year-olds who try to grow some facial hair, but it seems like someone tried to like mow a lawn, but then like maybe the power went off and they left the job half finished? <laughs> <laughs> like, I had a friend like whose mustache never met his beard, right? And he would actually try to like comb his mustache the other way so that it could meet the tip of his uh, beard the other way so that it could meet the tip of his mustache, <laughs> right? So I didn't want to do any of that. So I was like, I'm gonna wait until I turn 30 like, right, and then at the peak of a masculinity, that's when I'm gonna grow my beard. <laughs> and here I was, like a happy 30-year-old guy, uh, you know, happy with my job, happy with, you know, my car, happy with my good, luxurious lifestyle, and then something terrible happened, right? And it has nothing to do with my beard. <laughs> yeah, and the something terrible that happened was I ended up having a conversation with a 75-year-old grandpa. To those of you who don't relate to this, let me tell you, having a conversation with like an old person is like the absolute worst thing that can happen to you, <laughs> right? Because they have this power to like totally undermine and like make you feel like your entire life is like absolutely worthless, <laughs> right? Like, have you ever noticed like how all their conversations almost start like, oh, you know, like back in the good old days, and then like eventually it ends up, you know, by saying, you kids are just lazy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And that's how it is. Like, oh, back in the good old days, like, you know, we would do, like, real jobs. Like, we would go out, like, to the farm. Like, we would, like, cut trees. And, like, you know, like, we would do, like, real jobs with, like, real hands. And, you know, like, we would build our, like, own houses. And if there was, like, fire, we would, like, try to save ourselves. And not just ourselves, we would carry people on our back, you know? <laughs> Your kids are just lazy. If there's fire, you would probably just stand by the window and, like, shout for help. Like, right after posting it on your Facebook, <laughs> you know? And, uh... And at the same time, the other thing that I always notice with old people is like, oh, back in the good old days, like, you know, like, our music was, like, so good. Like, it was real music, and the lyrics were, like, super soulful. Like, I kind of agree on that, because, come on, people, like, lyrics these days, right? Like, I got me some braids. I got me some hoes, right? <laughs> uh, what is it? Rocking my sleeves. I can't ball with no Joes, right? <laughs> Conquered on my toes. Yeah, always fun listening to like an Indian guy with like Indian accent trying rap, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's not the point. Like, can you imagine me telling my grandkid like when I'm 60, oh, back in my good old days, you know, Post Malone had like really soulful lyrics, <laughs> you know? 
So I give them that, but I still don't like, I don't get it. Like that doesn't give them the power to like completely undermine our life just because they did something decent, like, you know, something important during the youth and like had like have a, have a half decent music to go with it. Um, my friend actually had the worst of it. Like he had his grandpa who would like constantly tell him like, uh, well, that's my grandpa impression, by the way. <laughs> I always go like this. <laughs> Um, oh, when I, when I was like 16, like my mother died and like then since then I had to like take care of like my 10 year old and six year old siblings, like I would cook for them, then walk like 10 miles to like great grocery and like, you know, then work in the farm, like in the sun, like I would burn myself and like, look at you, like, you know, it's 11 a.m. on a Wednesday and you're still sleeping. And that's something I just don't get about old people, like they hate to see young people sleeping. It, fe it almost feels like it's a crime <laughs> for us to sleep like after 6 a.m. It's almost like if we wake up at 6 a.m., all our problems will be solved automatically, <laughs> right? So yeah, Kevin, uh, no, not Kevin, my friend, <laughs> he had it, like, you know, he, uh, he, his grandpa would keep telling him, like, you know, like, I had to, like, wash my own clothes because, like, my mother didn't, wasn't there to, like, help me out, like, you know? Um, like, I would, I would walk, like, 10 miles, like, to even find, like, the closest grocery store. And, like, one day, like, my friend, like, had enough of it and eventually he snapped, he's like, are you gonna feel better like if all our mothers eventually died? You know? <laughs> Anyhow, thanks everyone. <laughs> uh, Yogi! That's what it was like when I was growing up in India also. <laughs> um, Guys, I think we're actually about to make history here. I checked the uh, record books, and I think this is the first time ever that we are having both sides of a married couple perform in the same night in Somerville, Massachusetts. Apparently already working with plus 250 man points. Give it up for Jen Living Good. <laughs> confession to make. I'm a Midwesterner. <laughs> I'm from a town of about 1,800 people in the middle of Illinois in the middle of a cornfield and I've lived here for about 10 years and y'all have a lot more things to do here than we did back there. So for leisure we would usually set something on fire or we would go to the exciting social scene at the post office. <laughs> and if we were feeling particularly fancy, we might drive on down the road to Walmart. <laughs> so driving, it's different here than it is in Illinois. I, it seems like they teach driver's ed that they, they put the kid in the car and they say, okay, well, here's the car and here's the horn. And the whole driving thing, eh, you'll just figure it out. <laughs> If you honk at somebody in the Midwest, mainly like in Illinois, I don't know, other states too, um, <laughs> you're probably going to make the person question their life choices and they're going to drive into a fucking lake. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a little rough if you end up honking at a Midwesterner. So, the stereotype is true. Midwesterners are extremely nice, and they will go out of their way to avoid any kind of conflict. So um, I've noticed people are a little more direct here, that um, they'll just say it how it is. So take, for example, you get a sandwich, and you ask for no mayo. You're like, yeah, I don't want any mayo in my sandwich. And uh, you get it, and it has mayo on it. So a Midwesterner would respond to that and go up to the counter and say, Excuse me, I don't want to ruffle any feathers, but this has mayo. <laughs> Which is quite different from the way that a Bostonian would handle that. They would most likely say, dude, I didn't any order any fucking mayo. Take the fucking mayo off. <laughs> so yeah, there's a little bit of a difference there. And I've also noticed that there's a difference in lingo and accent here. Um, I lived here for about two years until I found out what a packy is. <laughs> I actually thought it was something dirty, so <laughs> I didn't say it because I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know what that means. I actually had an interesting situation at work. 
where I told my coworker, yeah, you know, I watched that show Pawn Stars. And uh, he's like, Pawn Stars? <laughs> and I said, yeah, you know, that reality show. And then there was this incredibly big, awkward silence. <laughs> he's like, so what do you watch? Girl on girl pawn? <laughs> Threesome pawn? <laughs> And then it hit me what he was saying, and I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll watch all kinds of pawn. <laughs> so I've been living here for about 10 years, and my Midwestern side and my Bostonian side are sometimes in conflict. And uh, this all came to um, a big conflict one day when I was on my way to work. I ended up trusting a fart. I'm Midwestern, we trust things. <laughs> so I took a good old rendezvous over to Target to get some pants. <laughs> and the cashier was chatty. And he said, it's raining outside. I haven't been outside. Is it going to stop raining? I hope it stops raining. I've got plans this afternoon. I thought, oh God, how do I respond to this? Do I say, oh yeah, you're supposed to clear up. It's gonna be really great this weekend. That was my Midwestern side. My uh, Bostonian side went out. So I ended up saying, dude, I just shit my pants. <laughs> give me my card, give me my wallet, let me go. <laughs> so he responded, typical Boston, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jen Living Good. I'm not that trusting of a Midwesterner. <laughs> All right, guys, our next comedian is obviously funny. <laughs> Talk about, the, I mean, the lineup so far. Can, can we just get one more round of applause for everyone that's gone so far? <laughs> These guys brought their A game for you. This, this is amazing. All right. Our next comedian is very funny as well. Give it up, everyone, for Caroline Grassi. <laughs> Gosh, summer is ending. It is so sad. And I spent a lot of my uh, summer in weddings uh, this year, which I'm actually really okay with because I love being a bridesmaid. And I think I'm actually the best bridesmaid ever. Like, I am sought after for my bridesmaid skills. Um, just some quick tips on how to be a really great bridesmaid. You can keep it light, keep it real, and stay in complete denial of the complexities of marriage at every single stage of the process. <laughs> So like take a bridal shower, for example. Like it's so sweet that the bride's like family and friends and estranged cousins are all gathered around her. And like there's always someone's like demented grandma who's there. And it's like so great to have her included for like her socialization and to remind everybody of like of our like impending mortality. <laughs> like she was youthful once and now death follows her like a shadow. <laughs> it follows all of us like a shadow. And she gets so many great presents, the bride. And like, I can't like help to think when like she's eventually zapped of her youth and value in society, the only like artifact of her worth will be like a decorative plate set that her aunt definitely regifted. <laughs> and I love the Bloody Mary mimosas at a bridal shower. You know, you're in a classy one, you get a Bloody Mary, uh, uh, bl uh, blood orange mimosa. Excuse me. And then like the bachelorette parties, like. Oh my god, I love a bachelor party. Like, give me the sash that says Bride Squad in it. I'm like totally in. And like, I went to this one, like, and we like, the girls were all very naughty. Like, we had to get like sexy underwear, and the bride had to guess who gave what. And I got her a Hanes five pack of um, <laughs> extra support briefs because, like, with age and childbirth, like, comes incontinence and like prolapsed uteruses. Like, they, they say like diamonds last forever, but it's really elastic bands that do. <laughs> and then, like, the wedding. I love weddings. They're my favorite. The romance, the flowers, the cake, the functioning alcoholism on full display. <laughs> and like, I'm always the one to take the bride to the bathroom because you know with the dress and the buttons and like the ribbons and it's just, you need an extra hand. You cannot get out of a dress without strangling yourself. 
but it's like such a great moment to like connect with a bride and be like, you know, have you like thought about the prospect of like potentially having to change your husband's adult diapers if he were to become paralyzed in a terrible accident? Like, <laughs> have you thought about the loneliness that would become when your lover becomes, uh, you, you become a caregiver to your lover? Like, have you, does your employer have long-term disability benefits? Like, benefits are so cute. <laughs> And then like, I've been noticing this trend, like all my friends are going to the Caribbean for their honeymoon, and like it's so warm and sunny, and I give them a good like bon voyage. I say, you know, remember like, Zika can stay in your system for years. Like, could you love a baby with a squished up brain? I know I couldn't. <laughs> and then when they like come home, like I always give them their wedding present, like afterwards they have something to look forward to. Um, and because I love technology and I believe that there should be no secrets in marriage, I get them an Alexa. Because like the sur uh, surveillance state has definitely like not been checked. And like, I'm like guys, like who is more evil? Like Amazon or Russia? Like, no really guys, which one's gonna kill us first? Like Alexa, which one? Is she here? No, okay. <laughs> <sighs> You know, I have never been asked to give a toast at a wedding. I don't know why, because I'm such a good bridesmaid and I'm so good at this, but if I were to be able to give a toast, I would end it with, you know, congrats on finding somebody who will find your body before it melts into the floorboards. We all die alone anyway. To the happy couple. <laughs> Thank you so much. Caroline Grassi, woo! never hosted before, but it turns out I really am a woo guy. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm wooing for it. I'm woos all around. <laughs> all right. Um, not our final comedian, but our final Midwestern comedian coming up next. <laughs> this, this guy is darn funny. Give it up for David Dobbins! Thank you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, they say dress for the job you want, not the job you have. So at work, I wear a suit because I want to be dead. <laughs> uh, guys, I've been living in Boston about a year, <laughs> um, but I was born and raised in Minnesota. Uh, and in Minnesota, we're known for being very nice, very nice, extremely nice. Want to know how to piss us off, though? Here's what you do. Talk shit about milk. <laughs> about milk? We'll shit our pants. Um, excise tax. <laughs> He's like, Dave, get fucked. <laughs> uh, this next part uh, really splits the crowd, um, so let's do it anyway. Um, guys, wh why is, why does, what's up with, What's up with Tom Brady kissing his son on the lips? <laughs> What's going on with that? Have we seen this video? Have we seen it? Some people have seen it, and they're like, I'm not saying shit. <laughs> uh, some of you might have repressed it. It is graphic. <laughs> it is graphic stuff. And I, and I saw like the, I saw the R. Kelly documentary, right? And I saw the, the Michael Jackson documentary, and I started to think, what would the Tom Brady documentary be like? <laughs> Coming soon to HBO. Surviving Tom Brady. He wears number 12 and he kisses one too. Please don't hurt me. Uh, guys, like I said, I'm from Minnesota. Um, has, has anybody been to Minnesota before? Any, anybody? Yeah? What, what was the occasion? Really, where? Egan. They, I love Egan. Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> they weren't? Oh, okay, okay. Hey. Shout out, yeah. Get in, go. That's kind of like the Buffalo Wild Wings Express. That's more, of, more like that. Absolutely. Well, uh, in addition to um, having babies, uh, it's a very beautiful place, um, especially this time of year. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll get to see our state flower, the lady slipper, or our state bird, Michelle Bachman. 
Michelle, you old bird. Um, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you tonight with uh, just a couple of slogans because um, I know a lot of people haven't been to Minnesota. So these are going to give you an idea of what Minnesota is like. Minnesota is Canada with guns. Minnesota is Maine with jobs. Minnesota is Florida, but not at all. Thank you so much, guys. David Dobbins. Oh, whoa. did we turn? Oh, there we go. David Dobbins, you guys. Can, can we get one more time? That was. <laughs> one thing against Minnesota is that people drive their trucks on the ice there, and it's so dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> it's so dangerous. <laughs> All right, our next comedian, um, he said he's not doing this bit, but I feel like I need to tell you guys this anyway. He has participated in more than one ghost hunting exercise. <laughs> Everybody, put a round of applause together for Tyler Tuttle. That's been real close to the edge all night, <laughs> and it's been bugging me. Settle down. Whales and dolphins are fucking idiots. <laughs> Evolve gills or get the fuck out of the ocean. I love that somebody applauded. It's just trying. <laughs> yeah, fuck whales. <laughs> he was just waiting for that all night. So tired of these smug ass whales. <laughs> all right. Um, I have other things. Um, I really wish I could have been there for that awkward transitional month in which little Bow Wow had to tell the people in his life, it's, uh, it's actually just Bow Wow now. <laughs> um, fun fact, back in the day, ghosting meant when a man died at sea and then would haunt his widow every time she took a new lover. Because <laughs> he's a ghost. Right. Um, <laughs> they go high. Oh no, we go high. They go low. Sounds like very inspiring advice when taken as a metaphor. But when taken literally, it's the exact strategy that lost us Vietnam. Because <laughs> we were in helicopters and they were in tunnels. <laughs> it's a joke you have to explain, but that's what makes it worth it. It's not. Um, OK, I have one more. Um, and then uh, other stuff. I'm not done yet. Don't worry. Um, it's a good thing. Batman fell into that cave of bats instead of like down a sewer grate or something. Cause then he would have had to call himself piss and shit guy. <laughs> All right, that's where the bar is. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, I've been single for a long time. That awkward silence is the sound of everyone choosing believe it. <laughs> uh, um, Yes, um, I think it's pretty obvious because no one with anyone at home who cares about them leaves the house looking like this. <laughs> so I dress me. It's my style of dress has been referred to as apathy chic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, because of how single I've been for how long, I've been on the apps for an equally long amount of time. I don't know what's happening right now, but I'm finding a majority of the women I'm matching with right now happen to be non-monogamous. I don't know what kind of vibe I'm putting out there, but apparently it's one that says, you're gonna need a little something extra once I'm done with you. <laughs> Cause I'm a terrible lover, get it? Uh, all right, no I'm not. Uh, yes, uh, being on the apps has also taught me the answers to questions that I never would have thought to ask. Such as, what is the goodbye kiss policy after eating ass on a first date? The answer, because I know you all want to know, uh, is you wait for her to lean in because not everybody likes their own brand <laughs> of ass. <laughs> all right, yeah, I knew that would be divisive, <laughs> and it was the losing side of divisive. I'm going to keep losing you, and then I'll just leave. Um, in my time on the apps, I've only had the opportunity to reject one woman. This is because she had well, what she described to me as a sleeping beauty fetish, which is, uh, oh, 
Yeah, that's appropriate. That's a, it's yeah, that's you nailed it. Your first guest was right. And it's um I consider myself a pretty open to anything guy because as a soft 5, I really have to be. <laughs> but this is where I drew the line cuz she she described it as she takes sleeping pills every night that quote really knock her out. And again, quote because I don't want any of this attributed to me. Suggested I quote take advantage of her while she's unconscious. And I had two big problems with this. One, nobody's gonna believe what I just told any of you if they find me sweating on top of an unconscious woman. <laughs> <laughs> and two, I am very out of shape. So if I'm going to be making love to anybody, they better be putting in bare minimum 50% of the effort. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm about to get very winded very quickly. I do wonder if um, the other Disney princesses have gotten this treatment in the kink community. Like, is a Snow White just a gangbang where the woman's the tallest person in the room? Uh, is a Mulan where she dresses up like a boy, but like a really pretty boy that you wouldn't mind kissing? Even though you've never wanted to kiss a boy before. So now you have all these new and exciting feelings to explore. No one, just me. Um, and of course, a Pocahontas would be where you spend the night at a woman's place, and then when she's asleep, you steal all of her shit and give her family smallpox. <laughs> Thank you. So that's what we did. <laughs> Tyler Tuttle! Yeah. Sounds like we got a lot of Disney fans here in the crowd. <laughs> All right, only two more comedians to go. Thanks for hanging around. I mean, it seems like you guys have been laughing the whole time, so I'm sure you're not tired of it. And our next comedian is equally, if not more funny, because we only do it in perfectly ascending order. That's <laughs> Everybody, give Ariana McGee a warm welcome. <laughs> guys. So I have anxiety. Anybody else here have anxiety? <laughs> Let's give it up for anxiety. Anxiety is, <laughs> woo, yeah. Anxiety is awesome because like I can do this and be fine, but I'm convinced that my therapist thinks I'm a whiny bitch. <laughs> but for me, therapy is a lot like watching a horror movie and you know, like there's always that one person who's fucking everything up, but somehow I'm both the person who's screaming, you're gonna die at the TV, but I'm also the person about to obliviously skip into the killer's car. Only the horror movie would be like, small talk, I fucked up five. <laughs> I don't recommend the franchise. <laughs> Um, but apparently lately I've hit the perfect ratio of chubby and sad where I can complain, <laughs> so you can laugh, about literally <laughs> anything. <laughs> and the advice I get is to maybe start working out. It's like, oh, my upstairs neighbor is drunk and singing again at 10 a.m. on a fucking Sunday. Well, you wouldn't hear it if you were at the gym. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> So I'm trying to be good lately and go to the gym, but the gym scares me. It's like a front for a cult that I don't belong to, and everybody's just staring at me, waiting to correct my form. But by far the cultiest place in the gym is the women's locker room. And I hate to ruin any boyhood fantasies, a lot of dudes here tonight, but the women's locker room is like a portal to the least sexy dimension. <laughs> You make your way through the steam and you are met with the sight of at least eight Eastern European old women, or the elders as I like to call them, and they are all butt naked. So every time I go to the gym, I have to see a babushka's babushka. <laughs> but the craziest part is that they're always bent over, like breasts swaying. It's all just very hypnotizing. <laughs> But I need to know the secret to their confidence because I turned 29 this year and I already feel like the sun of my life is setting. I've given up, but like in a fun way. All my pants have elastic waistbands. My cat is legitimately my best friend. And apparently I have the genitals of an old lady. <laughs> uh, yeah, not in appearances though. I haven't gotten any complaints yet. Um, <coughs> no, a couple of years ago I was diagnosed with having an unusually dry vagina. <laughs> Fellas. 
<laughs> that tidbit did not make it into my Tinder bio. Um, but this is 100% true. You can check my medical records. And that's the exact phrasing. I had a medical doctor look me in the eyes and tell me that my vagina is unusually dry. <laughs> Unusual, as in not normal. Cool. <laughs> I imagine that by the time I'm an actual old woman, it'll just be like if a cat's tongue was a tube. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was gross. <laughs> anyway, hard pivot. Um, <laughs> is there anything worse than like an elderly person who's still living life with gusto? You know, you see these feel-good pieces like 90-year-old runs ultra marathon with an oxygen tank. Fuck you. <laughs> Like, now I have to feel guilty about being young and miserable like it's my problem. <laughs> I'm also at the age where I have a lot of friends who don't like to go out that much anymore and they'll go, oh, sorry, I didn't go out last night. Like, I'm such a grandma. No, you're not. <laughs> you're just a happy, healthy 27-year-old who doesn't need alcohol on late nights to numb the pain, Jessica. <laughs> <coughs> And I just feel bad for all these grandmas who are getting thrown under the bus. I just really hope that when actual grandmas cancel plans on a Friday night so they can drink rosé and make fun of Facebook photos of their old schoolmates' ugly grandkids, they go, sorry, I'm such a Megan. <laughs> <laughs> See, I feel like a grandma, but a much different kind of grandma. I feel like the kind of grandma that's like, that only lives for scratch tickets and cigarettes. <laughs> Thank you. Who's uh, 70 years old but doesn't look a day over 90? Maybe killed her fifth husband for the insurance money? Tells their 12-year-old grandkid, go to the packy for your grandma. <laughs> See, that's the kind of grandma I am. Thank you. Ariana McGee! All right, writing prompt for everyone when they go home, think about what kind of grandma you are. <laughs> <laughs> Our last comedian of the night, sad, I know, but um, actually, Jeremy, he's pretty active around the stage and I'm worried about the <laughs> cliffs here with him. Do you want me to move the flowers? I'll yeah? I'll deal with it. All right, he's gonna deal with it, ladies and gentlemen. A really, we need a really loud round of applause for our final comedian of the night, Jeremy Pearson. Thank you. Let's give it up for Pete. Great job hosting. Pete made this happen. Thank you, Vox Pop. This is an amazing space. Amazing space. Uh, all right, so uh, I had my birthday it was uh, two days ago. It's on Sunday. Thank you. It's not even a bit. I'm 37 years old. <laughs> I know. What are you going to say about that? Nothing. So, uh, so being in my 30s, uh, so, you know, dating. Dating obviously has its own, like, different challenges. Uh, like, oftentimes, uh, a lot of women who are around my own age, they have kids. Um, and so this uh, creates a problem, particularly on the, not a problem, but it's just sort of a, it's a challenge on the apps. Because basically, like, when you're messaging people, you've got to, like, indicate that you like kids. but not too much. <laughs> it's a perfect amount you can like kids. <laughs> it's a very fine line. Uh, and so I've learned a couple of lessons. Uh, one of them is that you can accept invitations to go to activities with their kids. You cannot propose activities to do with their kids. <laughs> you, can you can call them, you can like compliment their kids, but nothing more than two syllables. You can call them cute but not angelic. <laughs> so, uh, so I know, I'm, I'm sure it's no secret, everyone's probably noticed I have a pretty substantial butt. Uh, this means, I know, just wanna let the cat out of the bag. I know it's, it's, everyone's been talking about it. So, uh, the, uh, so this means that my butt oftentimes does things to my phone, uh, things that I sometimes have no idea how to do or how to undo. Recently in a 10 minute span, my phone sent three work emails, put my phone into do not disturb mode, and texted five people, including my mother, in French. <laughs> I don't speak French. 
but apparently my butt does. <laughs> People are worried about being replaced by robots, uh, but I'm worried about being replaced by my butt. <laughs> so uh, despite the caliber of that last joke, you'll have to, just have to take my word for it. So I actually have a PhD in history. Thank you. It's a very rare reaction. Before I got a PhD, I thought that people would care that I have a PhD. It turns out they don't at all, especially in Boston. Like literally, it was like I could just throw my keys and there's a 50% chance I'll hit someone with a PhD here. <laughs> I invited three people tonight. One of them has a PhD. Actually, no, actually I think two of them have PhDs and one of them is about to get a PhD. What are the odds? Anyway, so uh, yeah, so uh, so I, yeah, so I have a PhD in history. Uh, this, so this means that basically I'm a fake doctor. Uh, so if any of you have a major medical uh, malfunction, I really, good luck. I hope you have good insurance. Uh, so I think about this a lot of times uh, when I'm on the plane, the flight attendant getting over the intercom and being like frantically saying, "Is there a doctor on the plane?" At which point I stand up, raise my hand, and say, "Technically." My fantasy is that the flight attendant is like, thank God, doctor, there's a passenger in first class writing a thesis on Foucault. <laughs> smart audience, yes, Somerville audience, it's smart. <laughs> so uh, the only people who care that I have a PhD are 55-year-old uh, dads. I'm like a hot girl for 55-year-old dads. It's basically when a man hits his 50s, there's a couple of different paths you take one of which is a deep dive into Tom Clancy novels and history documentaries. <laughs> and let me tell you, those dads are thirsty for what I got. <laughs> they are thirsty. So I'm actually, uh, so I'm a, a medieval historian, which is fun uh, because when I text this to people, this is the thing my phone refuses to believe a human being would type to another human being. <laughs> so medieval is, for those of you who don't, have never tried typing medieval before, which is hopefully all of you. That'd be, are we really, thought, <laughs> CIA should really check your search history if you have been. Anyway, so medieval is M-E-D-I-E-V-A-L. And so often, so my favorite autocorrects when I try to text people that I'm a medieval historian are that I'm a mid, M-I-D, mid-evil <laughs> DeLorean. <laughs> or I'm a mid-level crematorium. There are two things here. The first, is my phone is like, these are both, whether you are a evil DeLorean or a crematorium, this is still a much more believable thing to text someone. <laughs> Two, they're like, even if you were either of these things, you would not be breaking the 60th percentile. So, uh, so speaking of history, has anyone here heard of young Stalin? <laughs> Who said yes? So you know about this, okay. The rest of you are about to be enlightened. So it turns out Stalin, so the Stalin, communist leader of Russia for about 40 years, who committed, who did a lot of things, including committing atrocities on his own people. It turns out that when he was young, he was also super hot. So for those of you who don't know, I encourage you to go home tonight, light some candles, Pour yourself a nice warm bath. <laughs> Pull up that photo. Look deep into your soul. And ask yourself whether you'd hit that. <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> it's like he did kill 20 million of his own people. But god damn, those lips are pouty. <laughs> he really is quite good looking, by the way. So uh so this is like a this is like a double uh it's like a double whammy that we do to like unattractive people. Cause like the fundamental idea behind the hot Stalin was that people refused, like people were just surprised that like attractive people can commit atrocities. <laughs> so like, you know, like Jeffrey Dahmer's, he's like, oh, he's the attractive serial killer, whatever. Um, and so it's like a double whammy. So like for unattractive people, like basically it's like, we're not only saying that not only are we not gonna fuck you, some shit goes down. You are definitely at the top of our list. All right, so uh, anyone here like hip-hop? On this side. The rest of the crowd does not like hip-hop. All right, so uh, I was not going to do this joke, but 
thanks to Tyler, he really broke the mold there. So, uh, so uh, no, so uh, so I so I'm, I'm super into hip hop, and uh, uh, so recently, uh, so t uh, two of my favorite. So I, I was listening recently to uh, Old Dirty Bastards, <laughs> Old Dirty Bastards, uh, Got Your Money, in which point he has a lyric that says. I don't have a problem with you fucking me, right? So I don't have a problem with you not fucking, or I, I don't have a problem with you fucking me, but I do have a problem with you not fucking me. Wow. Screwed that up. All right. <laughs> Which, so, like, hip-hop gets a lot of, uh, it gets a bad rap sometimes, no pun intended. Uh, oftentimes, but, like, to me, like, this is, like, this is, like, high-level, emotionally intelligent communicating. He's, like, not telling her what to do. He's just telling her what he has a problem with, what he doesn't have a problem with. And I really feel like this could be used in more situations. It's like, I'm imagining him as a roommate. I don't have a problem with you doing the dishes, but I do have a problem with you not doing the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> or, as a, uh, or as a diplomat, I don't have a problem with you not developing a nuclear weapons program, but I do have a problem with you developing a wep <laughs> nuclear weapons program. All right. <laughs> the that one needs that one needs some work. Uh, all right, so uh, so the uh, so two more things. So that so the, so one more. Then I was also listening to uh, uh, Ice Cube's um, "You Can Do It," at which point there's a lyric in there where he says, he says you've got ass for he's got he's got he said I, I've got dick for days. You've got ass for weeks. And I have not had time to do the calculations on this, <laughs> but assuming her. <laughs> ass is like three weeks big and his ass is like three days big. This is not only a temporal problem, <laughs> but it's a problem for me because I could never do this song. Like if I were doing this song and I, I, was, like, I, was, I was like, you've got ass for weeks, I've got dick for, you know what? Time is relative. <laughs> <coughs> so this, uh, so I was listening to this recently. So Spotify, I have this uh, playlist that I listen to called uh, Old School Hip Hop House Party. And I was very conf confused recently because uh, basically throughout, I listened to this for like two hours and the only ads I was getting were either for retirement homes or for IGF, like, like fertilization treatments. <laughs> and the first one I kind of, I eventually I figured out because, uh, so I signed up for Spotify through Facebook and I, just a long time ago when I signed up for Facebook, I just thought it would be funny to put my birthday as like 1921. <laughs> so Spotify thinks I'm like 90 years old. <laughs> The other one I don't quite get, but all I know is that I've seriously confused the algorithm. Because essentially they're like, there's only three things we know about this guy. <laughs> one, he has lived through the Great Depression. <laughs> Two, he is having trouble conceiving. <laughs> and three, he cannot get enough Wu-Tang. <laughs> all right, thanks guys. One more time, Jeremy Pearson. All right, everyone, that is our show. Thank you to Vox Pop. We just get one more round of applause for all the comedians up here. Oh, you guys are the best. Thank you so much for coming out. Have an amazing night.